السلام عليكم Are all the miracles of Prophet Muhammad peace and blessing be upon him in the form of prophecies about the future or scientific miracles? Why doesn't he have normal physical miracles for the people of his time? For example, Moses turned a stick into a snake, right? Moses opened the sea in half. Jesus healed the sick and rose the dead. Why doesn't Prophet Muhammad peace and blessing be upon him have miracles like that? You know, miracles reported by eyewitnesses like the ones of earlier prophets. Muslims keep saying that the Quran is enough proof of Islam. Because of that, Islamophobes are claiming that Prophet Muhammad peace and blessing be upon him didn't do any miracles. This is one of the repeated questions I have received in the past couple of months. Because during this period, I have been uploading videos about the scientific miracles of the Quran and about the authenticated prophecies of the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, that came true. But as per your request, in this video, I will be presenting some of the Prophet's miracles of his time. Some of the miracles that are reported by eyewitnesses. There are at least 150 reported incidents where the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, asked Allah for something and it immediately happened. Something supernatural, of course. There are at least 37 reported incidents when the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, got supernatural protection against an inevitable death danger. And I could not count the huge number of reported incidents when the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, supernaturally increased the amount of food or drink for his followers. Also, there are the reported incidents when the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, interacted with nature in a supernatural way. That is, in addition to healing the blind and the amazing knowledge of secrets that he presented. Secrets of his community, secrets about the future, secrets about the faraway future, and secrets about the past. We will also talk about the splitting of the moon, and finally I will tell you why I call this video the transparent prophet. Get ready, bring your coffee, and let's start. There are a lot of examples of supernatural healing narrated about our Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him. I will try to mention some of them very quickly. During the Battle of Uhud, when the pagans were surrounding the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, hating him and trying to kill him, a courageous man called Qatada ibn Nu'man was defending the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, with his life, preventing the pagans from killing him. Unfortunately, one of the pagans hit him on the face with a sword. What happened is, the sword cut his eyes open and took part of it out of its socket. His half eye was literally dangling down from its place. The Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, took his dangling eyes with his hand and put it back in its place. And it miraculously got healed immediately. That was in front of thousands of eyewitnesses. He said, now I see with this eye better than the other one. You can read more about this miracle here. During the battle of Al-Khandaq, the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him said, today the leadership will go to a man whom Allah and his messenger love. Then he said, where is Ali ibn Abi Talib? The friends of the Prophet said, he can't come, he can't be the leader. He is sick in his eyes, he can't see. So choose another leader instead of him. The Prophet said no. He went to Ali, he put his hands on Ali's eyes and made dua to Allah. His eyes immediately got healed and Ali took the leadership. The whole army of the Muslims witnessed this event. You can read more about it here. During one of the long journeys of the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him and his friends, one of them was called Jabir ibn Abdullah. Jabir has a sick, old and very weak camel. His camel was very slow. He could not keep up with the rest of the Muslims. He was behind struggling to catch up. The Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, went to him and said, Ama'aka qadib? Do you have a stick? Jabir said, yes. The Prophet said, A'tini, give it to me. Then he gently poked the sick camel with the stick. The camel was immediately healed. It suddenly became the fastest camel and Jabir was running with his camel in front of the Muslims instead of struggling behind them. 
you can read more about the super camel miracle here. That is in addition to the numerous supernatural healing incidents of the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him. Google the rest on your free time. There are at least 37 reported incidents when the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him got supernatural protection against an inevitable death danger. I can't read all of them in one video, so I will just give some examples. Abu Jahl is the man that the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him called the Pharaoh of our nation. He was an evil tyrant, very powerful, very oppressive. One day, the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him wanted to pray in front of the Kaaba. Abu Jahl said, if you prostrate here, I will put my legs on your neck and I will swipe your face over the dust and I will torture you. The Prophet ignored him. He ignored his warning, prayed and prostrated. So Abu Jahl ran to the Prophet to put his leg over his neck. But he didn't. He stood still behind the Prophet filled with fear. People asked him, why did you stand still? What were you afraid of? He said, if you saw what I saw, you would cry blood instead of tears. They said, what did you see? He said, I saw fire. I saw a trench. I saw monsters with big wings. I got super afraid. Then Allah revealed verses in Surah Al-Alaq. Have you seen the man who prevents a servant of ours from praying? No, never obey him, O Prophet. Rather, continue to prostrate and draw near to me. You can find all the details about this miracle in Tafsir ibn Kasir on Surah Al-Alaq or in this hadith. Another day. One man was complaining to the masters of Mecca about Abu Jahl. He said, Abu Jahl took my money and he's refusing to pay me back. People knew that Abu Jahl would never give him back his money, but they decided to have some fun with it. So they told the man, if you really want your money back, go to a man called Muhammad. He can talk to Abu Jahl for you and convince him to give you back your money. Of course, this was mockery. They know that Abu Jahl would never ever listen to the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him. The man didn't know though, and they wanted to have a laugh. So the man went to Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, and asked him for help. So the Prophet took the man and went to Abu Jahl, knocked on his door and said, give the man his money back. What do you think happened? Abu Jahl immediately gave the man back his money without a single argument. So people in Mecca were shocked. What? How did that happen? Abu Jahl never gave back any money in his life. And moreover, he would never listen to Muhammad and obey him. So they asked him, why did you obey Muhammad? Why did you give the money back? He said, I don't understand how. But when I heard the knock on my door, I got very frightened. And when I opened the door, I saw a frightening, huge monster, bigger than a camel. I had no choice but to give him his money back. Narrated by Ibn Hisham and by Ibn Kathir. After Allah revealed Surah Al-Masad, that declared Abu Lahab and his wife to be disbelievers now and in the future, and declared that both of their destinies will definitely be in hellfire. The wife of Abu Lahab got so angry, so she decided to take a big rock and throw it on the Prophet's face while he was praying in front of the Kaaba. A hit by a big rock on the head is enough to kill a man or to at least cause serious injury. So she went to hit the Prophet. But before she hit him, Allah made her eyes blind from seeing the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him. She's not completely blind though, she can see everything clearly, but the Prophet himself is transparent to her. She kept saying to Abu Bakr, where is this friend of yours? I can't see him. Tell me where he is so I can smash his head with this rock. The Prophet said to Abu Bakr, Oh Abu Bakr, don't worry about her. Allah has made her blind from seeing me. She can see everything else, but she can't see me. And this is the reference in the video title that you were waiting for. The Transparent Prophet Miracle. You can read the details in Tafsir ibn Kasir on Surat Al-Masad.
after the day of Khaybar. One woman from the people of the book decided to poison the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him. She grilled some meat and invited the Prophet and his friends for a friendly meal. But you know, a friendly but poisonous meal. While he was eating the meat, Allah made the meat talk to him. The meat said, I have poison in me. He stopped eating and asked the woman, Why do you want to poison me? She was surprised that he knew that. She said, We have a good reason for poisoning you. If you were a false prophet, we want to get rid of you. And if you were a real prophet, the poison will not affect you anyway. And you know what? The poison didn't affect him. The prophet did not die from the poison that day. The prophet died four years later. Technically, we can still call him shaheed, but the point still is poison didn't affect him. And grilled meat talked to him. You can read more about that here and also here. During the battle of Hunayn, the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him took a handful of dust from the floor and threw it in the direction of the enemy archers. And he said, Shahat al wujuh may your faces be blind. Then miraculously, every one of the enemy archers got dust in their eye. All of them got temporarily blind and they stopped showering the Muslims with arrows and then got defeated and then fled away. You can read more about this here. During the immigration of the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him and Abu Bakr to Medina, the Pekins were looking for him to kill him. They also hired professional assassins and put bounty on his head of 100 camels. By the way, the average camel today is worth 4,000 US dollars. That means that they offered something equivalent to 400,000 US dollars. That is to whoever could kill the Prophet before he reaches Medina. Anyway, the plan was that the Prophet and Abu Bakr should hide in this cave. It is called Ghar Thawr. It is basically a very small cave that is enough for one or two men to hide. They wanted to hide inside it until the assassins give up. Then and only then they can start traveling north until they reach Medina. But unfortunately the pagans found the cave. They were standing exactly on top of the cave door. Abu Bakr whispered in the Prophet's ear and said, لو أن أحدهم رفع قدمه رآنا. O Prophet of Allah, if one of them looks down, he will see us. We are literally in front of their feet. The Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, responded, ما ظنك بثنين الله ثالثهما. What do you think will happen to two men supported by Allah? Allah is our third, don't worry. Even though all it took for the pagan Arabs to find them was to simply look in front of their own legs. They still couldn't. Allah said in Surah At-Tawbah, إِذْ يَقُولُ لِصَاحِبِهِ لَا تَحْزَنْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعْنَا The Prophet said to his friend, Don't worry, Allah is with us. فَأَنزَلَ اللَّهُ سَكِينَتَهُ عَلَيْهِ And Allah sent down tranquility on him وَأَيَّدَهُ بِجُنُودٍ لَمْ تَرَوْهَا And supported him miraculously with forces that you didn't see. Now about this miraculous forces. These forces prevented the pagans from fighting them. There are some narrations that say it was a spider that built its full web extremely quickly and a bird that built a full nest also extremely quickly and laid eggs in it. So when the pagans came, they said, it is impossible for anyone to be inside this cave because there is a spider web literally on the door and there is a bird's nest and it has eggs. If the prophet and his friend is inside the cave, they would at least break down the spider's web. They can't be in there, this... This web is unbroken. And these pigeons, they would not build. These narrations are not 100% proven to be correct yet. So if you want to stick only to the authenticated narrations, we will just say that Allah supported him with miraculous forces that we don't know. And these miraculous forces prevented the pagans from seeing them even though they were in front of their legs. You can read more about that here. After the pagans went away, the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him and Abu Bakr started their journey to Medina in the desert, thinking that there was no one following them anymore. But unfortunately, a man called Suraq ibn Malik found them. He was one of the assassins looking for them. 
he was trying to kill the prophet and take the huge bounty of 100 camels. When he almost caught them, the prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, asked Allah for protection. The horse of Suraka suddenly got stuck to the ground. The sand under it turned into something that looks like quicksand. He got off the horse and took a lot of time and difficulty to get it out of the sand and then tried to catch the prophet again. But before he could reach the prophet, guess what? Quicksand again. He kept trying until he gave up. And in his last time, he raised his voice and called the prophet from behind and said, I see that you are protected. I see that you made dua against me. How about you make dua for me instead and I will help you. The prophet made dua for him. The horse got out of the sand and it was not quicksand anymore. Then Soraka went back and kept meeting the other assassins looking for the prophet and telling them what? Telling them, I already searched this area and definitely the prophet is not here. Look somewhere else. Later he became one of the great early Muslims. You can read more details about this miracle here. The first big battle between the Muslims and the pagans was called the Battle of Badr. Or to be specific, Badr al-Kubra. The Muslim army was 300 men and two horses. The pagans army was 1,000 men and 200 horses. Of course you understand that weapons and equipment like shields, camels, horses, stuff like that decide the fate of the battle more than just numbers. The point is pagans were much, much more superior in both numbers and in equipment. And this was the first battle. People were afraid. Yes, they will fight for the sake of Allah, of course, but they were still human. They feel fear. Two miracles happened in this battle. Let's talk about them one by one. Before the battle, the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, had a dream. It was about the battle with the pagans. He saw the pagan army as very, very few and weak. There is nothing to be afraid of. Then during the battle itself, all the Muslims miraculously saw the same thing, but this time in real life, not in a dream. They saw all the pagan army as few and weak. Again, nothing to be afraid of, even though this was not the reality. But Allah is also taking care of their psychology too. So when they fight, they fight with courage and with tranquility. That is in Surah Al-Anfal verses 43 and 44. And subhanallah, you can see that happening in all Muslim history. No matter how powerful their enemies are, they always saw them as small and weak. That is still the case till today. If you are watching the news this year, you should be familiar with what I'm saying. Anyway, the second miracle was not about their psychology. It actually defined the result of the battle. First, Allah sent 1,000 angels in physical man form as fighters. فاستجاب لكم أني ممدكم بألف من الملائكة مرتفين. Then Allah sent behind them more angels in physical form, a total of 5,000 angels who fought side by side with the Muslim army. يمددكم ربكم بخمسة آلاف من الملائكة مسومين. Without the support of Allah, the lack of numbers, equipment, horses, and the psychological element would be enough for the Muslim army to be defeated. There are numerous examples of the miraculous protection of Allah for his prophet and for the Muslims. I can't present all of them, so I will only present one more for this video. You can still Google the rest of them on your free time. The Day of Al-Ahzab I decided to separate this into a different chapter, because in my opinion, the day of Al-Ahzab is the most significant miracle in the Prophet's life. In the day of Al-Ahzab, the pagan tribes of Arabia united together and gathered all of their armies on one goal, to fully obliterate Islam and the Muslims, to delete them from history once and for all. The Muslims were very few in number and in war equipment. There was no way for them to face all the armies of all the pagan Arabs united together under one leadership. That was impossible. Muslim men and women were certain that this was their inevitable death. 
it was the end for them. Either leave Islam and go back to paganism or leave this life altogether. Of course, they decided to stick with the Prophet until their last breath. Allah describes their status in Surah Al-Ahzab. إِذْ جَاءُوكُمْ مِنْ فَوْقِكُمْ وَمِنْ أَسْفَلَ مِنْكُمْ Remember when they came at you from above you and from under you. وَإِذْ زَاغَتِ الْأَبْصَارُ وَبَلَغَتِ الْقُلُوبُ الْحَنَاجِرُ When your eyes grew wild in horror and your hearts jumped into your throats. وَتَظُنُّونَ بِاللَّهِ الظُّنُونَ And you entertained conflicting thoughts about Allah. The believers were reassured while the doubt of the hypocrites grew more fierce. هنالك ابتلي المؤمنون وزلزلوا زلزالا شديدا. They were put to the ultimate test. It was like a violent earthquake to their hearts. وإذ يقول المنافقون والذين في قلوبهم مرض ما وعدنا الله ورسوله إلا غرورا. The hypocrites and those with sickness in their hearts said Allah and his messenger have promised us nothing but delusion. This was the ultimate test. No hypocrite would ever decide to die for the sake of his life. This was the day when the true Muslims proved themselves to Allah and the fake ones got exposed. This day, the Muslims decided that there was no way for them to fight and stay alive. Their only hope to have a small chance of survival and to save their women and children was to dig a trench and defend behind it. I want you to imagine the scene. This is the city of Medina. As you can see, in both sides, the east and the west, the land is not leveled. So enemies can only attack from the big opening to the north or from the small opening to the south. So the decision was to dig a big trench that cover all the north side and to make a treaty with Banu Quraida, a tribe from the people of the book, who were living in the south entrance. So they would protect the city from the south while the Muslims are protecting the city from the north. They made the deal with Banu Quraida and they started digging the trench. While digging the trench, they got stuck. That was because one of the rocks that they couldn't break. The rock was so solid, all the strong men in the Muslim army tried to break it but without any result. It was unbreakable. So they went to the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, and told him, none of us in the whole army could break this rock. What should we do now? We can't dig the trench and the enemies are approaching. The Prophet was a 50 years old man at that time. 50 years old man is a weak man. If the strongest men in the youth of the Muslim army together can't break the rock, what can a 50 years old man do? Surprisingly, he didn't say that. He took an axe and he hit the rock three times. He hit the rock the first time and said, Allahu Akbar, I was given the keys of Asham. Asham is the area of Palestine, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, this part. Then he hit the rock the second time and said, Allahu Akbar, I was given the keys to the Persian Empire. Then he hit the rock the third time and said, Allahu Akbar, I was given the keys of Yemen. And the rock broke. The Muslims couldn't decide what to be shocked more by. The fact that he broke the unbreakable rock or the fact that he's talking about defeating all the world powers while they are preparing for their inevitable death. What is this guy talking about, right? The Muslims were very few and about to be deleted from history by the pagan Arabs while the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him is breaking the unbreakable stone and telling them that they will triumph over the Arabs and the biggest, strongest two superpowers of the world back then. And surprisingly, he was correct in every word. Subhanallah. You can read more about it here. Now let's talk about the battle itself. The trench plan succeeded. It delayed the pagan armies from obliterating the Muslims altogether. Instead of dying today, we will at least put up a fight before we die. But the unspeakable happened. The people of the book, remember Bani Quraida, they committed high treason. Maybe one of the ugliest high treason incident in recorded history. They made a deal with the enemy pagan armies to let them inside the city from the south to attack the women and children of the Muslims from their back. This is when the Muslims knew that it was the end. Everyone was preparing themselves for death. 
They felt the same way like, for example, imagine an aeroplane in the sky and the pilot is telling the passengers that the engine of the plane exploded and there is nothing I can do. You have two minutes before the plane crashes. You're going to die now. So say your last words. This is exactly what the Muslims felt. This was when Allah decided that the test is over. Allah decided that I didn't decree that because I want Muslims to die. No, I wanted to show the real believers from the hypocrites. And that's it. That was the whole point. This is when the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, raised his hand and said, Allahumma munzil al-kitab, sari'a al-hisab, Allahumma hzim al-ahzab, Allahumma hzimhum wa zalzilhum. Allah, you are the one who revealed the book. You are the one who is swift in reckoning. Allah, defeat the united pagan armies. Allah, defeat the united pagan armies and shake them. Then Allah sent only one of his forces. One of the forces of nature that we take for granted. The force of wind. Wind is a blessing until it reaches a certain level. Above this level, it becomes a deadly force. The extreme wind blew their armies, pulled up their tents from its places, and their horses and their livestock ran in fear. Their equipment and their provisions were flying away. Army men started to suffer pain and sickness. Imagine a tornado blowing on one side of a trench while the other side is standing in safety. Allah defeated all the allied forces on his own without needing any Muslim man to raise one sword. And in my opinion, the choice of using just one force, the force of wind, is giving the pagans a message. You're nothing. You were expecting what, like, you know, angels coming and, you know, like something that you would uh, see in a science fiction movie. No, just wind. This is all it takes. This is how insignificant you are. يا أيها الذين آمنوا اذكروا نعمة الله عليكم إذ جاءتكم جنود فأرسلنا عليهم ريحا وجنودا لم تروها. O believers, remember Allah's favor upon you. When enemy forces came to besiege you in Medina, and we sent against them a bitter wind and forces that you couldn't see. وكان الله بما تعملون بصيرة. And Allah is all seeing of what you do. This is of course referring to differentiating the hypocrites from the real believers. Allah defeated all the allied enemy forces on his own. And all the men of Banu Quraida who committed the ugliest high treason in history got the capital punishment. And of course, as you can imagine, the number of eyewitnesses to this specific event is equal to all the inhabitants of one city plus all the pagan armies of the allied forces combined. There is no way anyone can deny it. Now let's read some examples from the many eyewitness reports of the supernatural interaction between the Prophet and nature. One day, people saw a man trying to ride a cow like riding a horse. The cow, of course, is not letting him, so he keeps hitting his cow. Then the unimaginable happened. The cow talked to him in human language, in front of eyewitnesses, and said, This is not why I was created. The man said, Subhanallah, a talking cow. And the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, said, فَإِنِّي أُؤْمِنُ بِذَلِكَ أَنَا وَأَبُو بَكْرِ وَعُمَرِ This is what I believe, me and Abu Bakr and Umar. Another day, a wolf attacked one of the sheep of a shepherd. The shepherd ran and caught the wolf. Then the unimaginable happened. The wolf talked to the shepherd in human language and said, Why do you prevent me food? This is my provision for the day. Let me eat. The shepherd said, How is that possible? A wolf talking in human language? The wolf said, Why are you surprised? Do you want me to tell you something that is even more surprising? There is a man called Muhammad in Yathrib who is telling people what they don't know. The shepherd went to Yathrib and looked for Muhammad and told him the story. The Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, said, فَإِنِّي أُؤْمِنُ بِهَذَا أَنَا وَأَبُو بَكْرٍ وَعُمَرٍ This is what I believe, me and Abu Bakr and Umar. I believe that before the hour comes, two amazing communication phenomena will happen. This is the first one. A wolf talking to a man in human language. 
The second one didn't happen yet. It will happen in the future. A man will get out of his house, go far away from his family, then he will talk to something in his hands or something on his thighs, and this something will talk back to him and tell him what his family are doing back home. You can read more about this in this authenticated report here and here and here both of them happened another example one day a family of muslims in medina had a camel that went rogue a camel going rogue means it becomes violent it refuses to hold people or bags on it and it becomes dangerous to deal with sometimes it can kill a person they went to the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him and asked him for help, as it was their only camel and they used it for farming. People told the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him, don't go near the camel, it's dangerous. He said, Laysa alayya min hubas. It will not harm me. He went to the camel. When the camel saw the Prophet, it immediately prostrated its face on the ground in front of him. And this camel spent the rest of its life as an obedient camel working in the field, plowing and watering. Then the eyewitnesses said, If the animal without intelligence prostrated to you, then we also want to prostrate to you, O Prophet of Allah. Then the Prophet said, لا يصلح لبشر أن يسجد لبشر. It is not correct for a human to prostrate to another human. You can read more about it here and here. There is also another narration of a camel that cried in front of the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, and talked to him. The camel said to the Prophet, my owner is not feeding me, and my owner is overworking me. And the Prophet condemned the owner for doing that. You can also read about it here. Another day, a bird came to the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, and kept moving its wings in a weird way. Then the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, said, who took her children? A man said, I did, but how did you know that I took her children? The Prophet said, give her her children back. You can read more about it here. During the time of Sha'ab Abi Talib, the pagans denied the Muslims all trade and all provision. They put the Muslims in something that looks like an open-air prison for three years. During this time, they were prevented from their basic needs, including food itself. Until the Muslims started eating tree leaves just to stay alive. Uh, I think there was one report of uh, one of the Sahaba saying that whoever of us found a dead animal skin would be considered rich. Anyway, this covenant was written on a piece of paper that was hung inside the Kaaba itself and the door was locked. This is what they do to any covenant that they want every tribe to respect and follow. Then, when it was time for the decree of Allah, he sent ants that ate the paper of the covenant. They ate all the paper except a small part that had the word Allah on it. The Prophet then said to Abu Talib, his uncle, Allah sent ants that ate the covenant, all of it except one part that had the name Allah. Abu Talib went to the elders of Quraysh and told them exactly what the Prophet said. They said, how does he know that? The covenant is inside the Kaaba and only we have the keys. There is no way for him under the blockade to know something that's going on inside the Kaaba. But they went to the Kaaba anyway, opened the door, you know, just for fun, to check on it. And turns out that was exactly what happened. The ants ate the whole paper except the part that has the word Allah on it. They were amazed by two facts. Number one, the ants didn't eat the piece of paper that had the word of Allah on it. And number two, how did the Prophet know that? While they only have the keys to the Kaaba and he is in the blockade in Sha'ab Abu Talib. This miracle marked the end of the pagan's blockade on the Muslims. You can read more about this miracle here. During the Prophet's journey to Asham with his uncle Abu Talib, eyewitnesses reported a cloud following him all the way wherever he went. If he goes right, the cloud goes right with him. If he goes left, the cloud goes left with him. It provided constant shade from the sun to the caravan. Then after they met the monk who was preparing food for them, the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, went to sit under a tree. And the tree above him bent down to provide better shade for him. You can read more about it here. 
and by the way, here is the authentication for the narrators. According to the Muslim history scholars, this part of the narration is authenticated, and the other part is yet to be proved. And here is also Ibn Hisham's poetry about this miracle. One day, the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him was outside in the desert with his friends. He wanted to relieve himself, but there was nothing to hide behind. And privacy is something that is important to the Prophet. So he said to one tree, In qadi alayya bi Come to me with the permission of Allah. Then the tree came to him. Then he said to another tree, In qadi alayya bi Come to me with the permission of Allah. And the tree came to him. Then he relieved himself behind the two trees combined. After he finished, the two trees went back to their original places. You can read more about this here. Another day, the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him said to a man, It would be good for you if you believe in Allah and his messenger. The man said, And who testifies for you? The Prophet said, This tree will testify. Then the tree came to him and testified that he was a prophet and he is saying the truth three times. Then the man, of course, said his shahada. You can read more about this here. And if you want more Talking Trees examples, you can read some of them in this link. Now I want to tell you about a man from Bani and Najjar. He was a Christian pretending to be Muslim for a while. Then he started saying that he was the one teaching the Prophet the Quran in secret. Sounds like the Islamophobes of today, right? Back then, of course, no one believed him because the revelation was coming before him and for years after his death anyway. But as a sign for anyone who lies about Allah and his messenger, this is what happened to him. After his death, they dug his grave and buried him. The next day, they passed by his grave and found his body above the ground. They couldn't understand how that happened. So they dug a deeper grave and buried him again. The next day, they passed by his grave and found his body above the ground again. So they decided to dig a very, very deep grave underground and bury him under meters of dust and sand. The next day, they found the earth, spit him out again. So they gave up on him and left him to rot. This is a sign for all of those who lie about Allah and his prophet for breakfast every day. You can read more about it here. Of course, we can't close this chapter without mentioning the night journey, Al-Isra wal Mi'raj. And because this topic alone is very big and can take two or three hours just to present in details, I will only talk about a small part of it. One night, Jibreel alayhi salam came to the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, in his room in Mecca took him on something called Al-Buraq. Al-Buraq is a creation of Allah that is capable of traveling at supernatural speeds. First, they went to Jerusalem, where he met all the historical prophets of Allah, including Moses, Jesus, Abraham, everyone. All the prophets, peace and blessing be upon them, were there. They all prayed to Allah in congregation, together, behind the leadership of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him. I think everyone knows what this group prayer behind the Prophet's leadership symbolizes. Then Jibreel took him outside of this universe in a journey to meet Allah from behind a veil. In this meeting, Allah decreed the five-day prayers on us. Then Jibreel took him back to this universe to Jerusalem and then back from Jerusalem to Mecca. When he arrived, his bed was still warm. This is mentioned in Surah Al-Isra and in Surah Al-Najm. Anyway, let's focus on the important part. When the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, told his story to the pagans, they didn't believe him and they asked for proof. How come you went to Jerusalem and back in one night? It takes us month to do that. He said, I have a proof. On my way back, there was a traveling caravan. When I passed by them, their camel got afraid and ran away from them. And they started to look for it, but couldn't find it. So I stopped, I talked to them, and I told them exactly where their camel was and I drank from their water. They should arrive Mecca after three days. When they come, you ask them if I'm lying or not. So the pagans waited for three days and the caravan came and they validated the prophet's story. But the pagans still had doubt. Mm, no, we don't believe. 
So they told the Prophet, we will test you. We have people among us who are merchants who are going to Jerusalem a lot. So if you are telling the truth, our merchants who go to Jerusalem every year will ask you about the details of the city, check if you went there or not. They started asking him about every street, about every marketplace, and so on. And he answered all of their questions correctly. And those pagans knew him since he was a baby. They know that there is no chance for him to know this information about Jerusalem. The fact that he could provide this information accurately shows that he was a prophet and the night journey was real. That was proof enough for any truth seeker. But after all that, they still insisted in denial, unfortunately. They told him still, we say you are a liar. And Allah didn't send anyone. So he asked them, what else do you want? They said, if you are a real prophet, then split the moon in half in front of us. You know what? I will be annoying. I will not complete the story now. I have a dedicated chapter about the moon splitting, so stay tuned for it. I just want to say something about this part of the story. Some disbelievers keep claiming that there is not enough proof. You give them proof, they ask for more. You give them more proof, they ask for more. It is a never-ending loop. Those people are not really looking for proof. They just don't want to believe. And they are using the proof demand as an excuse for their disbelief. They already decided they don't want to change their haram lifestyle. They want to keep their one-night stands. They want to keep drinking intoxicants. They want to keep gaining their haram money. They want to keep doing adultery. They don't want to break their haram relationships. They don't want to wake up for Fajr every day at 4 a.m. to pray. So they will just keep hiding behind this statement. Give me more proof. Give me more proof. And it doesn't matter whether you provide evidence or not. Nothing will ever be enough because it's just an excuse. I am sure most of you meet those people every day. Alhamdulillah, you're not one of them. During the day of Al-Ahzab, while they were digging the trench, food and time were very limited. So everyone was digging day and night non-stop without having enough nutrition to support what they're doing. Jabir ibn Hayyan saw the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him very tired and very hungry. He ran back to his wife and he asked her, do you have any food or something to offer the Prophet? She told him, we have one small goat and some wheat. By the way, this is a small goat. A small goat might weigh something like 5 or 6 kilograms. When you slaughter it, it will give you 2.5 to 3 kilograms of meat and bone. She said, this is what we have, so make sure you invite the Prophet to eat privately. Tell him he can come and he can bring 2 or 3 of his friends maximum. We don't want everyone to know that we have food because you know everyone is hungry and we can only offer so little. So he went to the Prophet and invited him in private. He said, O Prophet of Allah, we have food for us and you and maybe two or three other people of your choice. So we invite you to come to our house. The Prophet got so happy and he stood up and raised his voice very high so everyone in the whole army can hear him and said, Ya Ahl al-Khandaq, inna Jabiran qad sana'a su'ran, fahayya hala bikum. Jabir has prepared food for all the Muslims of all the tribes. Let's all go to his house and eat. Jabir ran back to his wife and told her, There is a disaster. The Prophet invited all the Muslims to our house to eat from the small goat we have. She said, What did you say to him? Did you ask him to invite the whole army? He said, No, I told him to come and choose only two or three people with him maximum. But the Prophet invited the whole army. The Prophet came first. He came to the house and he made dua to Allah to bless the little food they have. And he started feeding himself, every one of the Muslims, one by one, from the small goat. More than a thousand people ate from the three kilograms of meat, until all of them was full. And afterwards, after every one of them ate, the pot that had the meat in it was still full. The meat and the wheat have not decreased, not even a little bit. You can read more about it here. A similar incident happened during the Battle of Tabuk. 
Muslims were very low on supplies. And Omar ibn al-Khattab said to the Prophet, How about we all gather whatever food we have left and put it in front of you and you ask Allah to bless it for us. So you know it would be enough to feed the whole army. In other words, he was expecting the Prophet to do exactly what he did in the day of Al-Ahzab. The Prophet agreed. They gathered all the small amounts of food they had left. And the Prophet made dua to Allah for blessing. And then everyone in the whole army ate until they were full. Not only that, wait for it. And after they ate, there was still enough food left for all of them to fill their containers. Everyone ended up with more food in their containers than before they started eating. You can read more about this here. A similar report was narrated by Abu Huraira. Abu Huraira, by the way, was a very poor man. One day, Abu Huraira got some money and finally bought a small bag of dates. He had an idea. Instead of just eating the bag of dates in one meal, I can go to the Prophet and ask him to bless it for me. So, you know, I get more dates. The Prophet made dua to Allah to bless his dates. Abu Huraira said, I kept eating from this small bag of dates for years. I finished it after 15 years. 15 years eating from the same small pouch of dates. You can read more about this here. A similar incident is reported in this hadith. And another in this hadith. And another in this hadith. And another in this hadith. As you can see, all of them are authenticated Sahih hadith. I don't want to spend an hour narrating eyewitness reports about the Prophet increasing food. There are at least 12 different incidents in different locations with different audience. You can Google them on your free time. Let's continue. On the Prophet's immigration day, while he was fleeing away from the pagans of Mecca who were trying to kill him, he passed by the house of Umm Ma'bad. He asked her if she had food or drink to sell him, but turns out she had nothing. She only had a young sheep. That was not old enough to start producing milk. He asked her permission to milk it anyway. She said, you can try to milk it, but it is still young. It can't produce milk. It doesn't make any sense to milk it. The moment he put his hand on the other of the sheep, it was suddenly filled with milk. Everyone drank from it and also had enough leftover milk for her and her husband later. You can read more about it here. One day Abu Huraira was very hungry. He went to the Prophet and asked him for support. The Prophet offered him a glass of milk. Abu Huraira was very happy with the glass of milk, but not for long. Because the Prophet told him, you should split this glass of milk between you and every poor person in the city. All of them should drink together in this small glass of milk. So Abu Huraira was a little bit disappointed, but he obeyed the Prophet's order anyway. Turns out that every poor man and woman and child in the whole city drank from the same cup of milk until they all filled their stomach. And finally, after they all drank, Abu Huraira came back with the remaining milk to the Prophet for him to drink too. He drank from it and said, Alhamdulillah. You can read more about it here. A similar report is narrated by Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. He said, One day the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, passed by my house and asked me for milk. I told him, Yes, I have sheep to milk, but unfortunately this sheep does not belong to me. It belongs to Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt, so I can't give you its milk. Then the Prophet asked him, do you have any young sheep that cannot produce milk? Do you have any young sheep that has not been touched by a male yet? He said, yes, but what's the point? They cannot produce milk anyway. Then the Prophet touched the other of the sheep and it miraculously started producing lots of milk. Everyone drank from it. You can read more about it here. As you can see, the Prophet repeated every category of miracles several times in different events in front of different audience. That is to make sure that there will be enough eyewitnesses reporting these miracles for us, leaving us with zero doubt in the narrators. One day, the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, was giving a public lesson. A man came and said, O Prophet of Allah, 
it has not rained for a very, very long time. The lack of water is causing our gardens to dry and our livestock to die. Can you please ask Allah for rain? The Prophet raised his hand and made dua to Allah for rain. Immediately, rain started to fall non-stop. Anas ibn Malik said, There was not a single cloud in the sky, not even a little one. But suddenly, a huge cloud appeared and it started raining heavily. It kept raining non-stop for six days until a man went to the Prophet while he was giving another public lesson. The man said, O Prophet of Allah, this non-stop rain will destroy our gardens and our livestock. So please ask Allah to stop it. The Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, raised his hand and made dua to Allah to stop the rain. And it immediately, immediately, immediately stopped. You can read more about it here. The same happened, by the way, during the Battle of Tabuk. Umar ibn Khattab said, we are almost dying of thirst. And we are in the middle of the desert. It felt like our necks are being cut out of thirst. Abu Bakr said to the Prophet, please make dua to Allah for rain. So the Prophet said, is this what you want? Abu Bakr said, yes. The Prophet raised his hand and made dua to Allah for rain. Immediately, rain started to fall. They all drank and they all filled their containers. Then Allah revealed verse 117 of Surah At-Tawbah. لَقَدْ تَابَ اللَّهُ عَلَى النَّبِيِّ وَالْمُهَاجِرِينَ وَالْأَنصَارِ الَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوهُ فِي سَاحَةِ العسرة. Allah has certainly turned in mercy to the Prophet as well as the immigrants and the helpers who stood by him in the time of hardship. You can read the details of this incident in Tafsir ibn Kathir to this verse. There are more than 150 incidents in different times, in different cities, reported by different eyewitnesses when the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, asked Allah for something supernatural like this and it immediately happened. During the period of Sulh al hudaybiyah the Sahaba went to the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, and said, The water well is almost empty. There is very little water left. We are afraid if we drink whatever is left, we might die of thirst after that. The Prophet took a small glass of water and said, Bismillah, and threw it inside the well. The well then exploded and flooded with huge amount of water. Everyone drank as well as the livestock, and they filled their containers. You can read more about it here. One time when the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, and his friends were traveling a very long distance in the desert. Because the road was very long, they ran out of water. They started to suffer extreme thirst. And there was a disbeliever woman who had a small skin pouch with a small amount of water in it. This small pouch was enough for one person though. So the Prophet offered her to buy it from her in exchange for some dates and some food. Then he made dua to Allah to bless this small pouch of water. Forty men drank from it until they were full. Then all of them filled their big water containers from the small pouch. The woman went back to her family and said, I met this weird man. He is either the best magician in the whole world or he is a prophet of God. By the way, later she and all of her family accepted Islam. You can read more about it here. Another time when the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, was traveling with his friends, they were again out of water. They only had one container that had a small amount of water left. The Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, put his hands in the small amount of water and said, the blessing is only from Allah. Then. A spring of water gushed from between his fingers. Imagine flowing water from his fingers the same way it flows from your kitchen tap. Everyone had enough water to do wudu, to drink, and to fill their containers. You can read more about it here. That happened several times, by the way. You can Google the rest of the narrations on your free time. One day, Jabir ibn Abdullah came to the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, and told him, My father had a lot of debt before he died, and its due date is today. I have to pay his debt on his behalf. I don't have enough money though to pay them, so what should I do? Please help me out. The Prophet told him, Okay, harvest whatever dates you have from your garden and divide them into categories. Separate each type of dates in a different container. 
He did, but they were far from enough to pay the debt. Then the Prophet made dua to Allah for blessing on the dates. Then Jabir started taking from his dates to pay back the debt. So he paid the debt after a debt after a debt after a debt. He finished paying off all the debts of his father, then looked back at his dates. They didn't decrease, not even a little bit. You can read more about it here. A similar incident happened to Salman al farisi He wanted to ask his owner for freedom. And to become free, he has to pay his owner some money, as you already know. The owner was not a good man. He asked for 300 palm trees. Imagine, 300. Normally, to grow 300 palm trees, you have to plant in the soil 600 of them because you know half of them will die in the process anyway. And you will have to wait for a lot of years for a palm tree, palm tree to grow up. It's not like any normal trees, palm trees takes more time. The owner is basically asking for something impossible because he does not want Salman to be free. But the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him told Salman, don't plant the palm trees yourself. I will plant them for you with my own hands. Then the Prophet did not plant double the required number. You know, 600 instead of 300. He planted only what was needed and miraculously, all of them grew up. And they grew up in less than one year, without any losses in the process. Let's try to understand what happened. Instead of 5 years and 50% losses, they grew in month with 0% losses. You can read more about it here. And you can find hundreds more eyewitness accounts of similar events when the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him supernaturally increased provision. The last one that I want to talk about is the well of Zamzam. The well of Zamzam is a blessed source of water that Allah provided initially for Hajar radiallahu anha and then to all humanity. The dimensions of the well are actually very small. It is just 30 by 1.5 meters. A well with that dimension should dry out if a thousand people drank from it. That's it. And we all know that the deserts of Arabia are not known to have enough rain to refill the well after every time it dries up. So normally, we would expect this well to dry up in like one day in the pilgrimage season. But you can see until now with your own eyes, today again with your own eyes, millions and millions of people drinking from it every single day. I'm not telling you a story from the past. I'm not telling you a story narrated by eyewitnesses I'm talking about today. Not only millions of people are drinking from it, no. Pipes are pulling thousands of liters out of it to be packed for transportation. These packs get shipped to thousands of destinations all over the world. And remember the millions and millions of men and women doing their pilgrimage? Yeah, each one of those millions take 10 liters with him or her back home to give his family and to give his friends. In the season of Arafat around 15 million are drinking from the same well every day and it never dried up once now or in history. This is something that you can witness with your own eyes right now. The Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, demonstrated supernatural knowledge throughout his life. It seems impossible to count the amount of information that the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, provided throughout his life. The information that there was no way for him to know. I already provided a lot of them in the first three chapters of the Prophet's Time Machine video. Those three chapters are one hour of non-stop examples of the supernatural knowledge of the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him. Some of them were about the future, some of them were about his time, some of them were about the past. If you missed it, I will leave a link to it in the description, you have to check it out. But for now, I will present more examples that I didn't mention in the Time Machine video. The Prophet peace and blessing be upon him sent a letter to the Emperor of Persia, inviting him to believe in Allah. The king tore the letter, and then he sent two men to the Prophet. They said, Our Lord orders you to be present in front of him as soon as possible. Seems like he wanted the Prophet to be killed in front of his eyes. 
Like, how dare you send me a message to ask me to believe in Allah? Anyway, the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, told the two men, there is no point taking me with you anymore because your Lord just died right now. Allah told me that your king's son had just killed his father. Of course, they didn't believe him. In the 7th century, there is no way you could know something that happened in another country in 10 minutes. The news typically took weeks or months to arrive. They didn't believe, but they were still super confused because of the confidence of the Prophet and his way. They said, you know what? This is not how kings talk. Either he is a real prophet or something weird is going on. So they waited for the news to arrive from Persia. Turns out, the king of Persia was killed by his son on the same day that the prophet said it. How did he know? You can read more about this here. The same happened, by the way, with the good king of Abyssinia. The prophet one day stood up and told his friends, the king of Abyssinia just died right now. Let's go pray for his mercy. Again, back then in the 7th century, it was literally impossible for someone to know something that is happening in another country live. You can read more about this miracle here. On one of the journeys of the Prophet and his friends, there was one hypocrite between them. The Prophet tested them to reveal the hypocrite. His camel got lost. He asked his friends to find it for him. They kept looking and looking and looking, but they couldn't find it anywhere. After a lot of time searching, they got tired. But they never gave up, except one man. He said, isn't Muhammad claiming to be a prophet? How come he tells us about God, but he can't tell us about his camel? The friends of the prophet said, you are a hypocrite. If you don't believe in Allah and his messenger, why are you pretending to be one of us? They went back to the prophet and told him about the hypocrite and asked him, Where is the camel? We can't find it anywhere. He said, the camel in this valley, in this specific location inside the valley, and its rope got stuck to a tree. They went to this valley, and they went to the specific place in the valley the prophet mentioned, and they found the rope of the camel stuck to the tree. Exactly what the prophet said. You can read more about this miracle here. One day, the prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, told a secret to one of his wives. Then she disclosed it to another wife behind his back. Then Allah told him what happened. The Prophet told her, Allah told me what you've done behind my back and presented to her part of the conversation she had with the other wife. This is when she knew that there is no way to hide anything from the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him. You can read more about this miracle here. In the Prophet's time machine video, we talked about when Allah revealed that Abu Lahab would die as a disbeliever 10 years before his death, right? And we talked about how is this something that a false prophet would never ever do? Because it is a huge risk if a man decides in this full 10 years to reveal that he is a Muslim, the whole message will be ruined. A false prophet would be smart enough to predict something that is in the far future, not something that can happen tomorrow or the day after tomorrow or basically a never-ending everyday risk. What I didn't mention in the Time Machine video is Abu Lahab is just an example. There are other people too that Allah declared to die as disbelievers. And this declaration happened while they are still alive. So let's talk about another one of them. Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira. Allah said about him in Surah Al-Qalam, سَنَسِمُهُ عَلَى الْخُرْطُومِ We will mark him on his nose. It was a great shame for an Arab man to be marked on the face. This was something typically done to animals, and it would be humiliation to be done to a man. In the case of Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira, Allah declared two things about him. First, he will be marked on his nose. Then, he will be forever in hellfire. If any of them did not happen, then Muhammad is a false prophet. Again, huge risk only a real prophet would take. A fake prophet will not take a risk like that except if he is super dumb. And even if you don't believe in Muhammad as a prophet, you will still agree that he was very, very smart, as all of these billions of people are fooled with him. In your opinion, of course. So because he was a real prophet, this was exactly what happened. On the battle of Badr, Al-Walid ibn Mughira got marked with a sword on his nose. He had to live for the rest of his life in shame, 
marked on his face and on his pride. And then he died as a disbeliever. Subhanallah. You can read more about this in Surah Al-Qalam. On the day of opening of Mecca, Abu Sufyan was looking at the Prophet and his friends around him, and he was thinking privately in his head, I hate this. I hate that these people are following Muhammad. I think I should collect a group of strong men and violently get rid of them. Remember, all of that is in his head without making any sound. While he was thinking that, a hand poked him on the shoulder. He looked behind him to see whose hand was it. It was the hand of the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him. And the Prophet told him, إِذَنْ يُخْزِيكَ Allah. Allah will not let that happen, whatever you're thinking of. He was shocked that the Prophet could also read his secret thoughts. Then he said, مَا أَيْقَنْتُ أَنَّكَ نَبِي حَتَّى السَّاعَةَ I was not certain that you were a real Prophet until now. Now I am certain. Then he became a Muslim. You can read more about this here. One of the things we take for granted these days is the existence of GPS satellite technology. Every time we want to build a new mosque, to determine the Qibla, the direction of prayer, all we have to do is to open our phones and open our GPS app and get exactly where is the direction of the Qibla, right? But did you know that even now, even using this technology, we still have some error, sometimes one degree, sometimes two degrees. The direction is not exactly to the Kaaba. Sometimes it's next to it. Sometimes it's very far away. If you're building a mosque in a very, very, very far away city, one degree difference is enough to make the direction of the Qibla completely off. When you draw a straight line, sometimes the lines doesn't even go to Mecca city itself. It is outside of Mecca. But you know, God is all forgiving or merciful. What I want to talk about now is one of the amazing miracles of the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him. One day, the Prophet ordered the building for a mosque for the people of Yemen. By the way, the Prophet was not in Yemen. He ordered someone to go to Yemen and ask people to build a mosque. And he told him, if you want to get the direction of prayer correctly, you will find a garden called Bazan. Go to this garden. And make a line between a rock inside the garden, the rock of Ramadan, exactly to the top of mountain Din. Remember, the Prophet never saw all of this stuff, never saw the rock, never saw the mountain. He doesn't have GPS app on his phone in the 7th century. He just mentioned all of these points and the coordinates of the straight line of the Qibla from 1000 kilometers away. The man went to Yemen, he told the people to build a mosque, and amazingly, it is still standing until today. Now let's use satellite imaging to see the coordinates that the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, ordered from 1,000 kilometers away. He ordered them blindly. He never went to Yemen, so as a normal man, not a prophet, it will be a blind guess. However, because he was a prophet of God, now, when we use satellite imaging and make a line between the two coordinates he provided, it goes exactly, exactly to the building of the Kaaba. I'm not saying it goes to Mecca city. I'm not saying it goes approximately somewhere around the Kaaba. It goes exactly to the building of the Kaaba itself. This is Mount Din. This is the stone of Ramadan. And that straight line goes exactly to the Kaaba building itself. Remember, the Prophet was 1,000 kilometers away and he didn't get the GPS coordinates from his ancient iPhone Pro Max in the 7th century. Subhanallah. I think these are enough examples of the Prophet supernatural knowledge. Don't forget to watch the Prophet's time machine video. It has one hour of non-stop examples. At last, we reached the moon splitting. I made a separate chapter about it because people make a big fuss about it more than any other miracle. Is there any proof from NASA that the moon split? Did Neil Armstrong find the moon split when he walked on the moon? So ridiculous. First, it is not more significant than other miracles of the Prophet. It is not more significant than having a spring of water coming from between his fingers. 
it is not more significant than putting a man's eye back in its socket in the middle of a battle in front of thousands of witnesses. It is not more significant than feeding thousands of people from three kilograms of meat. It is not more significant than traveling from Mecca to Jerusalem and back in the same night. It is not more significant than Allah defeating the allied pagan armies on his own without any intervention from any man. All are miracles, all are supernatural, all are reported by eyewitnesses, and the reports are verified in every part of the chain of narrators. What is the difference? Why do people ignore all of these amazing miracles of the Prophet and just focus on the moon splitting? And let me ask you, if you are in front of a disbeliever who already decided that he will reject all these hundreds of amazing miracles, do you think the moon splitting will change his mind? What, what do you classify as miracles? Yeah, you can see the uh, sea has parted in the time of uh, Moses. You are telling there is a miracle uh, in Quran. What is the miracle? The splitting of the moon. Huh? The splitting of the moon. Don't you see the moon still now there? <laughs> Don't you see the sea is still together? <laughs> you said Jesus brought to someone to life. To Show listen? me the person. Oh, 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 oh. Anyway, I will tell you all that I know so far. After the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him provided the pagans with sign after sign after sign, all significant miracles that were enough for truth seekers to find God and for arrogant deniers to find no excuse to get them out of hellfire. After all that, the Prophet said to them, what else do you need to believe? They said, if you are a real prophet, split the moon in half, let's see. He said, and then you will believe? They said, yes, if you split the moon in half, we will believe. He prayed to Allah for one more miracle and Allah split the moon in half and put it back together. Then the Prophet asked them, Now do you believe? They said, No, that was just magic. They are not different from the atheists of today. If an atheist of today watch my full 8 hour non stop evidence of Islam playlist, you will find him saying in the end, Ah, I need more proof. Asking for proof is just an excuse to give him more time as a disbeliever. He just don't wanna believe. Anyway, some Muslims tried to find evidence of the moon splitting from NASA. Brothers, that just shows lack of wisdom. They refer to videos like this one, for example. Let's watch a quick part of it. We know the moon is shrinking by looking at the lobate scarps in detail. They actually reflect the crustal materials of the moon being pushed together, breaking, and being thrust over one another. So that indicates that something has been causing the moon to actually contract or shrink. When I see someone referring to this video as evidence of the moon splitting, mm, I don't like that. And even if he's referring to this video as evidence of the possibility of the moon splitting, I still don't like it. Why? The definition of a miracle is something that is supernatural, something that is impossible scientifically. How are you gonna prove something that is impossible scientifically using science? It's a miracle, like Moses splitting the sea, or Jesus raising the dead. It is impossible scientifically, it is something that is reported by eyewitnesses. If you wanna prove it, all you have to do is to look at the eyewitness reports that are all over history books. A lot of them are verified including every piece in the chain of narrators. There are no history books on earth that verify the whole chain of narrators except the Muslim history books. Muslims validation process of historical event is at least 100 times better than any other history book on earth. So if someone denies them, he should first deny all history of all nations and live alone in his bubble of denial. I will explain that in details, by the way, in a separate video very soon. I promise in this video, I will prove to anyone that it is impossible for any man to reject the Islamic history books without rejecting all religions and all history of the world. Not now though. Anyway, some people referred me to this book. Maya hieroglyphic writing, specifically pages 230-231 until 233. It says that the Babylons, the Maya, and the ancient Chinese, all of them restarted their lunar calendar at the same time. 
Those civilizations existed in three different parts of the world. Most likely there was no connection between them and there was no reason for all of them to restart their lunar calendar at the same time. That is very apparent, especially when we look at the Maya, who lived in ancient Mexico, and the ancient Chinese. See the geographical barrier between them? Why would all of them restart their lunar calendar at the same time? And what I mean by restarting their calendar is starting by counting from the year zero again. Like what Christians did to their calendar and restarted it with the birth of Jesus, and like what Muslims did to their calendar by restarting it with the immigration day of the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him. Nations restart their calendars when something significant and huge happens. So according to this book, the ancient Babylonians, the Maya, and the ancient Chinese restarted their lunar, lunar calendar together in the same year reported to have the miracle of the splitting of the moon of the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him. The book doesn't say that the moon split, by the way. The book just says that was something very significant that made all of these civilizations restart their lunar calendar. If you're not familiar with the term lunar calendar, it is like the Arabic calendar, when we calculate months based on uh, the phases of the moon, not the sun. So you know it is the beginning of the month when you look at the moon and see a specific shape. Could this significant event witnessed by all of these nations be the moon splitting? Maybe, maybe not. But it had to be something considerable enough that was witnessed by people in Mexico and people in China at the same time. I don't consider that as proof in itself, but it is just a very big maybe. It just shows that the moon splitting is a viable explanation for this historical phenomena. Other people referred me to this article as proof. The split moon of the Madrid Codex and Persian manuscripts. Specifically, Vase K2772. It shows that the palace of the moon is being shaken by a quake. Indicated by the same question mark curls found in the ears of the split-faced moon rabbit and identified by Eric Thompson as a symbol of the moon goddess. This quake or catastrophe is well recorded worldwide, even in Peru as the rebellion of the artifacts. I know you understand, but before I explain, let me make sure first that they are not making up this vase. This is a website specializing in Maya artifacts. I will write in search K2772. This was the one they were referring to. We should find in it the curl symbol of the quake next to the moon goddess. Here it is, and this is also the curl symbol on the ears of the moon rabbit god. And his face is split in half. And here are the gods of the moon putting the rabbit back together in its original place. No more split moon, no more quakes. And to be more sure that the contents of the article is correct, it is mentioning page 91 of the Madrid Codex. So let's get the page. This is the page they are referring to. This weird guy is looking at the rabbit, i.e. the moon. But the rabbit has his face split from the middle. Then later the moon gods put back the rabbit in its original stats. One more thing we need to prove about this article. We need to really prove that the rabbit was the symbol of the moon. The rabbit was also the ancient Mesoamerican symbol of the moon and is depicted in the art of pre-Hispanic Central Mexico, classic Mayan and ceramic membrane art of the American Southwest. In Maya mythology, the moon goddess gave birth to the rabbit. Now you can read this article trusting its content, as everything that it refers to is actually verified. The problem though is this type of articles that are referring to pagan religions and you know celestial objects being represented by pagan gods and rabbit gods and whatever. Um, this is very hard for a layman to understand. I think the details in the article are too much to be handed by any other than a historical expert. If a normal person watches this, he would assume either it's guesswork or he will not understand anything. For this specific reason, I wouldn't present this as evidence to anyone, even if it was. No one would understand it anyway. 
But if you are the kind of person who can understand it, you can take a screenshot of it now and read it later on your own time. The point I'm trying to say is, are you comparing those pictures to the well-preserved hundreds of thousands of Islamic history books that are validated on every part of the chain of narrators? Do you really think that we need to look for a manuscript here or a manuscript there to verify something that is in an Islamic history book? In my opinion, we don't. And if you disagree with me or you don't understand why, wait until I make a video about the accuracy of the Islamic history books. It will be in one month maximum. Let's continue. Other people pointed out to me the Indian king who saw the moon splitting, then became Muslim, then built the first mosque in India. Here is a published graduate research letter from the MES Assambi College in India. Here is a popular story behind the mosque which was well known in Kerala even today. Once a king was walking on the balcony of his palace when he spotted the moon splitting into two and joining back again. Few months later, he got a few Arab visitors. The king learned about the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, from the Arabs. He set sail to Mecca to meet the man. He converted to Islam. The story is found in a Muslim account, as well as the Brahmanical narrative. The story has been retold countless times by the Portuguese, Dutch, and others. There is epigraphic evidence as well and it keeps going on to show the sources that narrated the same story. You can take a screenshot of it and read it when you are free. Other people pointed out this source in the Indian office library. I'm sorry I tried to get a photocopy of it to present to you, but I couldn't. If you can help out and get a photocopy for me, write me in the comments and we will get in touch. What I could found is this testimony of someone who contacted them and asked the librarian about it. Let's read the response of the librarian together. We do indeed hold in our collection a composite manuscript which contains such an account. A fabulous account of the first settlement of the Muhammadans in Malabar. Wow, he called Muslims Muhammadans. Well, yeah, it is from the perspective of a Hindu. Anyway, let's continue. A fabulous account of the first settlement of the Muhammadans in Malabar under King Sharkuti, a contemporary of Muhammad, who was converted to Islam by the miracle of the division of the moon. Then the guy was not convinced, so he sent the librarian again to ask him. Thank you very much for your help. Is it possible to know for sure if that account is actually a real historical event or simply a folk legend? The librarian said that in his opinion, it is most likely a legend. Of course, you understand the point of view of a Hindu. He will think it was a legend. Then he said, it may have been connected to a lunar eclipse. So in short, the document exists. The librarian is not denying the existence of the document. The librarian is saying that in his opinion, maybe it was not the moon splitting, maybe it was a lunar eclipse. He's just saying that he doesn't believe it. But his point of view is not what we're looking for. We're looking for one thing. Does the document exist or not? That is saying that King Sharkuti converted because of something that happened in the moon. And the answer is yes, it exists, but the librarian doesn't like it. Do you think this is evidence? Well, it's a very big maybe. But I still think that our authenticated chains of narrations are 100 times more accurate than all of these random manuscripts that archaeologists find. We can just use them to say that the splitting of the moon is a viable explanation to all of these historical mysteries. But proof only comes from validated sources, and only Muslims did the historical validation. For now, if you want to read the real references from real history books, of course, after you read Surah Al-Qamr, you can go check out this hadith. It is Sahih and Mutawatir. This is the highest level of authenticity that doesn't exist in any historical report on earth except here. You can also check this out. It is also Sahih according to Bukhari and Muslim. And there are also five other reports from different authenticated sources in Ibn Kathir al-Bidayah wa Nihaya, and more sources in al-Durr al-Manthur 
باي السيوطي After the death of the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him, Ali ibn Abi Talib was the one in charge of washing his body before his burial. Dead bodies usually have their distinct and pleasant smell and their features too, like for example changes to the skin, involuntary emptying of the insides, changes around the nails, hardening and so on. We don't have to talk about that in details. But you know a dead body when you see a dead body. This is what you expect. But what Ali said is طبت حيا وطبت ميتا I was expecting a dead body smell and dead body features but what I found was the exact opposite as well as his amazing fragrance You were blessed O Prophet of Allah with goodness when you were alive and also after your death I thought it is nice to end with this example This video is being so long and there is no way I can read all the miracles of Prophet Muhammad peace and blessing be upon him in this video. No one has the energy to keep reading for 10 hours and no one has the energy to watch it. So let me quickly answer two of your most repeated questions and go. Did all the miracles really happen or did the Arabs make up the miracles after the Prophet's death? The thing that people really need to understand about Islam is it makes you in a lifelong struggle against your desires. You desire to look at this woman in the street? Nope. Lower your gaze. You desire to eat and drink? Nope. Fast minimum 30 days a year up to 150 per year. You desire to rest and sleep in the night? Nope. You have to wake up for night prayer and for fajr. You desire to drink intoxicants? Nope. You can't. It's haram. You desire this piece of bacon that smells so good? Nope. You can't. It's haram. You desire to take this haram money, it's a good opportunity, you know, your life will be easier. Nope, you can't, it's haram. You desire to have one night stands? Nope, you can't, you have to stick to your wife. The list goes on and on and on for hours. Why would any sane person invent miracles that didn't happen in order to prevent himself from all of these pleasures? If thousands of people are going to come together and agree to make a huge lie and invent a lot of miracles that didn't happen just because they want to fast Ramadan and give uh, obligatory charity and prevent themselves from most of the luxuries in life, they would be so stupid to do that. If they are going to invent miracles, you would expect them to use these miracles for their own benefit, like what the church did in the Middle Ages. You would expect them to take at least 10% of everyone's income in Europe and sell indulgent parchments. But inventing miracles to convince people to do charity and to fast Ramadan doesn't make sense. Second of all, wait for my video about the authenticity of Islamic history and hadith. You will understand why it is impossible to fake anything in them. Next question. Islamophobes in their own videos claim that all of those miracles exist only in hadith and they don't exist in Quran. Why is that the case? Well, before you ask why is that the case, you should first ask is that the case or not? Because it is not the case. If you've been watching this video from the beginning, you can see that half of the videos are narrated from the Quran, not from the hadith. And if you are watching this playlist, from the beginning, from the Prophet's Time Machine video until this video, you will find that maybe more than half of the miracles are from the Quran, not from the Hadith. So, it is not the case, right? Second of all, take care because those Islamophobes, they are trying to take some verses of the Quran out of context to give it a different meaning. For example, verses that are talking about people who insist in disbelief. The people that no matter how much you give them proof after proof after proof after proof, they still ask for more. They ask for proof as an excuse for their disbelief. For example, وَقَالُوا لَن نُؤْمِنَ لَكَ حَتَّى تُفَجِّرَ لَنَا مِنَ الْأَرْضِ يَنْبُوعًا They challenged the Prophet. We will never believe in you until you cause a spring to gush forth from the earth for us. أَوْ تَكُونَ لَكَ جَنَّةٍ مِنْ نَخِيلٍ وَعِنَبْ فَتُفَجِّرَ الْأَنْهَارَ خِلَالَهَا تَفْجِيرًا or until you have a garden of palm trees and vineyards. 
and you cause rivers to explode in it abundantly. أو تسقط السماء كما زعمت علينا كسفا أو تأتي بالله والملائكة قبيلة Or you cause the sky to fall upon us in pieces as you have claimed Or bring Allah here and his angels before us face to face أو يكون لك بيت من زخرف أو ترقى في السماء ولن نؤمن لرقيك حتى تنزل علينا كتابا نقرأه Or until you have a house of gold Or you ascend to heaven And even then, we will not believe in your ascension until you bring down to us a book that we can read. Say, O Prophet, glory to my Lord, am I not only a human messenger? Islamophobe talking now. See, that is proof that the Prophet didn't make any miracle. No, it's not. These verses are showing how ridiculous the people who insist in disbelief are. No matter how many miracles and signs you show them, they will still not believe anyway. They are telling him, even if you fly in the sky, even if you have a house of gold, even if you do all of that, we will still not believe in you until you do more and more and more. These verses are to you, the Islamophobe, making the claim. You just don't get it because it is not the eyes that are blind, it is the hearts. They are asking for more proof, not because they need it. They are asking for proof because they want to buy more time as disbelievers without looking stupid. This man is an example of the verse and if they were to see every sign, they would still not believe in them. Okay, what would convince you in terms of evidence of the Quran and the Hadith? Whatever evidence you bring also, I'm not going to accept Islam. <laughs> Ashwin, I this is dishonest. I'm sorry. It's dishonest. dishonest. When evidence is presented to you and you Not still you deny evidence? and reject no, it, no, no, there's no point us having no. a conversation. What Islamophobes do is they take these verses out of context and try to use them as proof for their claims. They can't see how blind they are. It is like talking to a wall. Now I have to apologize to the wall for comparing it to them. They tell you that the Quran itself is saying that the Prophet had no miracles. See, let me give you an example. وَمَا تَأْتِيهِمْ مِنْ آيَةٍ مِنْ آيَاتِ رَبِّهِمْ إِلَّا كَانُوا عَنْهَا مُعْرِدِينَ Every time a miracle came to them from their Lord, they turned away from it. Does this verse in the Quran claim that the Prophet had no miracles or does it claim that he had miracles and they turned away from it? Something else that they do. There are verses referring to the destruction signs. First, we need to know what is a destruction sign. Noah's flood is a good example. The destruction of Qawm Thamud or Qawm Aad. The destruction of the people of Lot. It is when the disbeliever reach the end of their test. And they tell their prophet, you know what, give us whatever you are threatening us with. You're saying this God will destroy us, let him destroy us. And then what happens is actually God destroys them. And the people in Mecca, they said to the Prophet the same thing. So you find some verses, the Arabs saying to the Prophet, give us the destruction sign. But the Prophet didn't ask Allah for it and Allah decided not to do it because Allah knew that all of them will become Muslim in the end. They just needed more time. These verses are not saying that the Prophet had no miracles. These verses are saying that the Arabs didn't get a destruction miracle like the people of Noah. Brothers and sisters, don't ask help from an Islamophobe to translate a verse in the Quran for you. There are people who dedicated their whole lives learning and teaching the Quran. Asking an Islamophobe for a translation of a verse is like asking a janitor for medical advice instead of asking your family doctor. With all, of course, due respect to janitors, but you're asking the wrong person. If you reached this far in the video, first I want to thank you. Second, I want to ask you a favor. As you can see, there are millions around the world who are in desperate need of the guidance of Allah to reach them. And the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, said, deliver my message even if all you can deliver is one verse. It is your turn now. Like and comment to boost the video's reach online. Then share it on your social media accounts. You can also download it and upload it to your channel. It's 100% copyright free. Finally, if you missed all the 200 pieces of evidence that we presented in the Evidence of Islam playlist, you have to check it out. I will leave a link to it in the description. Also, make sure you check out our playlist, Women in Islam. 
it will change your perspective a lot. Thanks and don't go before you listen to some Quran with me. Salam alaikum. فأما الإنسان إذا ما ابتلاه ربه فأكرمه ونعمه فيقول ربي أكرما وأما إذا ما ابتلاه فقدر عليه رزقه فيقول ربي أهانا كلا بل لا تكرمون اليتيم ولا تحاضون على طعام المسكين وتأكلون التراث أكلا لما وتحبون المال حبا جما كلا إذا دكت الأرض دكا دكا وجاء ربك وجاء ربك والملك صفا صفا كلا إذا دكت الأرض دكا دكا وجاء ربك وجاء ربك والملك صفا صفا وجاء يومئذ بجهنم يومئذ يتذكر الإنسان وأن له الذكرى يومئذ يتذكر الإنسان وأن له الذكرى يقول يا ليتني قدمت لحياتي يقول يقول يا ليتني قدمت لحياتي يومئذ يتذكر الإنسان وأنى له الذكرى يقول يا ليتني قدمت لحياتي فيومئذ لا يعذب عذابه أحد ولا يوثق وثاقه أحد يا أيتها النفس المطمئنة يا أيتها النفس المطمئنة يا أيتها النفس المطمئنة ارجعي إلى ربك راضية مرضية ارجعي إلى ربك راضية مرضية فادخلي في عبادي وادخلي جنة